Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Atlantic Fellows Literary and Storytelling Festival. I'm Tanya Charles, Program and Impact Lead at the Atlantic Institute, and I'm really happy to welcome prison abolitionist and AFRI fellow Marlon Peterson, author of an extraordinary book called Bird Uncaged, a moving memoir about coming of age in Brooklyn and surviving incarceration, and then afterwards daring to live a life of precedence. Marlon will be in conversation with Panache Chigomaze. Panache Chigomaze is the author of These Bones Will Rise Again, 2018, which is a historical memoir reflecting on Robert Mugabe's military ouster through the spirits of anti-colonial heroine Mbuya Nehanda and her grandmother Mbuya Chigomaze. This book was shortlisted for the 2019 Ellen Payton Prize for Nonfiction. She's also the author of Sweet Medicine, her debut novel, also award-winning, as well as a contributor to many, many newspapers and journals, including the New York Times, as well as contributing editor of the Johannesburg Review of Books. Her work has featured in everything from The Guardian, Chimurenga, Africa as a Country, Boston Review, Transition, as well as The Washington Post and DZ. Currently, Chigumazi is a doctoral candidate in Harvard University's Department of African and African American Studies and History. Panache is going to be facilitating and holding this conversation as she navigates the various themes of Marlon's fantastic book. So welcome to both you, Marlon and Panache, but especially a warm welcome, Panache, as you hold this conversation for us. I'm handing over to you. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. I'm just really, really excited to be in conversation with Marlon, a really fantastic writer, first and foremost, and to meet an artist, because if you have the opportunity and you should really go out and read the book, that's one of the things, just understanding that to me, Marlon, first and foremost, is an artist. And it's really interesting to me that when you listen to his TED Talk, one of the last things he said is, let's make music. It's one of the metaphors that really runs throughout the book and how music and the various traditions that inform that as Black people from across the world is really something that has held us together, but has also held him throughout this. So I wish we could have asked you to play the steel pans for us today. <laughs> <laughs> Marlon is the host of a wonderful podcast, which you really should listen to, Decarcerated Podcast. And he is an Atlantic Fellow for Racial Equity. He's also the founder and chief reimaginator of the Presidential Group, a social justice consulting firm. Remember that presidential, he's going to be telling us about this word because Marlon is a wordsmith, and that's a really important part of who he is. And he is a 2015 recipient of the prestigious Soros Justice Fellowship. Ebony Magazine has named him one of America's 100 most influential and inspiring leaders in the Black community. He is also an Aspen Ideas Festival scholar and fall 2016 TED resident. His TED Talk, Am I Not Human? A Call for Criminal Justice Reform has over 1 million views. Marlon spent his entire 20s inside of New York State prisons for his involvement in a crime as a teenager. During that time, he earned an associate degree in criminal justice with honors. He spent the last five years of his incarceration as the head of the Transitional Services Center, where he created programming and curricula for men nearing release from incarceration. He also spearheaded and designed an experiential workshop for incarcerated men and college students from Vassar College called Vassar and Otisville, two communities bridging the gap. Thank you so much for being with us today, Marlon. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Let's just start by acknowledging that you've just become a father. <laughs> yeah, I just became a father two days ago. Yeah, beautiful little girl named Maya. Right. I mean, we're all in relation in community, whether biological or not. And it's always interesting how whether you're on the TED stage or an email, you always refer to us as family. That's always really important. Think about kinship and how we come together as right. communities. There was a really powerful conversation that you had with a social justice worker, an Aboriginal man from Australia, formerly incarcerated, who specifically speaks about being within prison and how he was meant to stay away from certain groups. And he's saying, that's my people. You can't tell me to stay away from these people being designated as the worst criminals. These are my people. What happens when we begin to think about people not as those who are disposable, but understand that these are our people. This is family. Marlon, would you like to start by reading the bit that you've chosen from Bird Uncaged? So I'm reading from chapter four. Chapter four is titled Dash. Uh, it's page 49. I want to also offer a trigger warning before I begin reading this. It's actually a letter I write to the person who sexually assaulted me as a child, as a 14-year-old child. Dear Dash, everyone has a dash, even you. You are the only person who can make me jump out of sleep. 
The only person who could cause my body to jolt at random times when you leap from my subconscious to my conscious. I wonder if you ever think of me. Do you ever get the same jolt as me? Do you ever wonder what happened to me after we met? Do you wonder if I ever told anyone about you? Do you wonder if and how you impacted my life? I wonder if you ever thought about how your past experiences perverted how you saw me when we met. What was your childhood like? Why did you take my childhood away from me? Did someone take yours? You're a part of my dash. You're an indelible part of my life that has shaped the way I walk in the world. Ironically, the first time I decided to give you the name Dash was at the funeral of a young man I knew who was murdered at 19, the same age I was when I went to prison. The eulogist spoke about the Dash on a tombstone, the day of birth to the day of your death. The speaker used the reference of the Dash to ask the audience of young mourners to consider what they will have accomplished during that Dash. What will they be remembered for? I understood the analogy differently. The young man who died was a participant in an alternative incarceration program that I worked for at the time. He was a Crip, and so were most of the young people in the funeral home that day. Crip is a gang in America. The room was filled with teenage boys in jeans, sneakers, button-down shirts, and dark shades to hide the sweat coming from their eyes. The girls were in their church dresses, and others were in their best house party outfits. All of them were crying, sobbing, punching their fists into their hands, gasping, whispering, cussing to themselves, hurting. I wondered to myself about our young folks who are out here dying and fighting and surviving in gangs and on street corners. What happened to them in their lives that could have led them to become walking hurt people who hurt other people? What led me? What was that, Dash? I didn't wonder what legacy we would leave behind. I wondered what was their trauma. Who was responsible for it? What happened to us who were all innocent ones, all cute and cuddly babies? The Dash, I felt then, is a cumulative trauma that shapes us from infancy. Who or what was part of your dash? I think I saw you three or four years later as I was walking down Fulton Street in downtown Brooklyn. You were standing on the street seemingly unbusy. I think you saw me too. I was bigger by then. I had held and shot guns off of rules. I knew people who I could get to beat the shit out of you. I could beat you by myself, but I was too ashamed to approach you. What if you said it never happened? What if you tried to embarrass me by saying out loud I was a faggot ass nigga? What if I hit you in a, and was arrested? How could I explain why I had hit you? How could I explain the first time I ever busted a nut, it was with you at gunpoint? That would earn me no hood stripes. 14-year-old men should be able to defend themselves. It was my fault. I wanted a bag of weed. I shouldn't have been smoking weed. I was a Jehovah's Witness. I was trying to be helpful by helping you move the boxes. How could a kid from 1990s Brooklyn with gunshots flew by every day be so gullible? Why did you exploit my ignorance? Who or what exploited yours? Did you ever wonder what type of student I was in school? Did you know I was close to honor roll that year? That I had been a valedictorian three years before we met? How were you in school? Did you know that just a couple months before we met, I was jumped so badly in school that I couldn't go back for a couple of weeks? They tried to rob me. And when I told one of the three boys that I had nothing to give them and pushed his hand away from my front jeans pocket, they beat me dizzy. I had to get a safety transit from George Westinghouse High School. I told my new friends at Martin Luther King Jr. High School that I was transferred there because King had more girls and boys, and I wanted to be where the chicks were at. I lied. I was ashamed. It was manhood shit or the toxic masculinity thing that smart feminists talk about. Words and terms I never heard about until I was in my 30s. Concepts that surviving street shit and prison shit did not allow for. It meant that I would use wanting to be around girls as an excuse for the deep hurt physically, but more so emotionally that being jump brought on. Then, too, I thought I should have been able to better defend myself or my walk should have been tougher or my clothes should have been more baggy like 1990s rappers. Or I should smoke weed because that was what tough niggas did. Or maybe I should carry a gun or a knife or a razor. Or maybe I should cuss more. Or maybe some other fake masculine shit I had learned from walking on Notion Avenue in 1990s Crown Heights that eventually landed my ass in prison facing a life sentence. I kept this truth a secret until I put these words in this passage. At 38 years old, that fake masculine shit no longer works for me. It ain't real. It took me way too long to outgrow the idea that that manhood shit, that toxic masculinity, that being harmed has nothing to do with my personal weakness, but more about your personal weakness. What was your personal weakness? Did you know that I would have rather kept you a secret? Did you keep me a secret? Did you ever feel like you had to keep someone or something tragic a secret? Years after we met in midtown Manhattan, I was shot and kept the details of the shooting secret. Jerked off for the first time at 18 years old because I thought it was a sin. So I kept it a secret from Jehovah and my father. 
got robbed at gunpoint for a chain on my own block when I was 16 years old and kept that a secret for, well, <laughs> until now. Because I thought I was a pussy for letting that happen. Felt I died before 21 and kept the reason why I felt that a secret. At 18, I almost pulled off a train, a rape on a chick without their knowledge. Almost went to prison for life and kept the detail of my involvement in the crime a secret for years. I became the harmer. The persons hurt by me were not weak. I was. I was dealing with the shit you were, are dealing with. Did you know that I was 14 years old and 14-year-old boys who think they are 14-year-old men should not have to keep heavy and traumatic secrets? Did you have to keep secrets as a kid? Did you think you were a 14-year-old man too? Are you still alive? Have you found the help you needed? Or did you continue to act out your pain, whatever it was? Did you wonder what became of me? Did you know I still think about you, that I'm still ashamed, that I still blame myself sometimes, that I still joke, that you can still wake me from my sleep? I somehow never hated you, though I hated the memory of you. Did you know that I have successfully compartmentalized you and have thrived despite not yet coming to grips with my own emotional deadness to intimacy? Were you able to perform being I as well as I do? I hurt those closest to me with emotional distance, but I perform being I to the world masterfully. In peace, Marlon, you hurt me. Thank you, Marlon, for sharing that. I just wanted to hold a little space for us to sit with that and absorb that that you shared with us just now. The bit that you go on to write immediately after that, the letter was the intro to your chapter four. It says, I'm like America. America hurts people all over the world every day. Weakness seeks out the strength in others to support its own fragility. I was being American. America, the beautiful, founded on masculinity and grit. America, the indivisible, that's a hope and fortune for itself and manifest destiny. America is me, a liar that supports its original injustice, being dishonored with itself. What's really interesting or what's really important is that throughout your work on mass incarceration and you know, abolition of mass incarceration is the question of moving from punishment to healing. And I think it's quite interesting that in characterizing this and saying that, of course, you mean from a very personal account of that hurt, but then flipping that and contextualizing it within America. Why is that? I think not only in the process of writing this book, but in the work I've done over the years, and a lot of my work has been around the violence prevention and, of course, mass incarceration or the abolition of mass incarceration, as you said, the easy thing has always been to put all the blame on individuals, us, the people, the individuals are doing these things. And not to say that us, the people, don't deserve to be held accountable. But I also think we don't exist in a vacuum. We don't come from another planet and just a place in certain communities, whether it be in parts of Brooklyn or other parts of a community near you that's socially and economically distressed. We aren't placed there. I've learned, but also in writing this book, it was important to me to show the multitude, but also the layers of harm and how it's happening. Although we don't need to perform or emulate what our government leaders do, we don't need to emulate that. We can choose not to emulate it. I don't want us to act as if that isn't playing a role. Like we aren't learning it from somewhere. The harm that we commit towards each other and come out of space, we see it. I think about particularly in an American context where guns are more important than humans. Wherever you stand on guns and whatever, you can travel the world and guns aren't held to high esteem as it is here. I'm not saying other countries don't have it. It isn't corruption, it isn't violence. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's like it's religious here. And the mere fact that we have so much gun violence here should not surprise us. Or we just put all the blame on these young folks. In that piece, I mentioned the crypt, like the kids at the funeral. I was intentional about that because it's easy to just like use that and say these kids in our communities are they're terrible and they're terrible and they're terrible. Not saying they aren't acting out terrible things, but I question some of us are. I did. But I'm also saying that we're mirroring, literally mirroring the environments that we're in. The hate you give. <laughs> You're right. The hate you give from Puck, right? Just speaking my own consciousness about some of these things, we'd listen to rap and people testifying. That was the testimony we'd hear about these things at that time. And before we had the language of mass incarceration, and you'd hear Puck saying things like, it's a system, it's a setup. And of course, you don't have the language to understand because we are so taught that this is about individual failure. Poverty is an individual failure. Crime is an individual failure. It's never about the systematic understanding of how specific communities are criminalized for the very same crimes that other communities 
would not be criminalized for. So even then, the emphasis on certain communities need rehabilitation or even empowerment as if it's not a societal problem. And you've had really wonderful conversations, and I really urge everyone here to listen to your podcast There's a specific conversation that you're having with a young man from Zimbabwe, Calvin Moyo. He's faced all kinds of issues with the legal justice system in South Africa, deportation, being falsely accused, and then, of course, then spending time in jail. And, you know, listening to his life story, just like many of the people you speak to, you can hear that many of the seemingly very individual traumas, you can go back to very structural and historic moments. He speaks about his family, his father having one wife in town, a wife at home in the rural areas. And you're thinking about wounded kinship. You're thinking about, well, this is migrant labor laws pulling apart of Black families. You can think about all these ways in which what is happening to his family is very much historical. It's very much something that you can see across different community groups. And it's not about individual failures of Black families. It's about the structural onslaught on Black families. I often speak to people about the fact that in South Africa, our trauma across the world, really, but also particularly in South Africa, is structural. It is historical. The fact that one of the most popular TV shows is Kumbulikaya, which means remember home, remember home. It's about people needing to be reunited with their families. And you could look at that show and say, well, Black families are just messed up. You can then go back and say, well, actually, there are reasons for the kind of trauma. There has been structural injustices that have made it difficult for people to hold on to kinship structures. And we're not talking about nuclear family structures. We're talking about people being able to have the communities of care and to be able to look after each other. Yeah, absolutely. I remember I had two experiences in South Africa. One was with a folk color community in Hanover Park in Cape. I spent the day there in this community in Hanover Park is riddled with violence. Same sort of violence that I've seen here or in Trinidad where my family from. And I spent a whole day with the folks who would be considered the perpetrators of it and spent time with them in their homes and, and spending time with them. In one vein, they're literally, in some parts, bragging about some of the acts that they committed just a couple of weeks before that. And they're also speaking about why they're doing it and questioning. They realize they're in this loop. They're just performing in the loop and that they don't seem a way of getting out of. Then another experience I had out there in Durban, I did a workshop in a prison there, a youth prison. And all these kids, I believe they were like 17 to like 26 or something like that, right? All these kids inside of there facing time or serving a lot of time, part for the train. There's about 25 kids in this room. All of them, except for one, were all Black kids. African Black people are obviously dominant in South Africa, but it's also where they were from. And they spoke about the communities that they were from. And the communities they were from are describably the same as Hanover Park. But it's also probably similar to when I mentioned Crown Heights growing up in the 80s or when I spent time in Trinidad and visiting some communities. I think part of what we always miss is that we spend so much time focusing on, as you had said, individual acts of harm and thinking that by focusing solely on individual acts of harm, we can create the type of safe communities that we need. And it doesn't work. You know, we can have a long conversation about structures and why things are the way they are, but more so than anything, for me, bringing it back to this past, but also this book, in any of my work, because I've been able to travel and be in a lot of interesting places, interesting conversations and communities. I wanted this work to be accessible to people who wouldn't necessarily be reading books about the structural issues and also accessible to people, younger versions of me, who think that they are the sum total of every problem they've ever had. Like they are the problem and there's no solution. In pretty much they're worthless. And because the worthlessness will lead them to doing things out of feeling of self-worth. So it's a perpetual problem, but also I think there's always hope in it. You mentioned that I have a daughter, a new life. She's born two days ago, so I haven't had much time to read anything. (laughs) But reading this now, I'm reading this with different eyes, right? For the first time, I'm reading this book with her in mind now. Like, she's physically here. Cute, cuddly baby. In no way does she have any tinge of any of the harm that adults can create towards each other or even young people. It's not there. It doesn't exist. And at some point, though, particularly for Black, Brown folks, those of us in the Global South, we put, and I say we, not mean this, but generally speaking, we put the weight of all of society's problems on those of us who are the youngest of us. And that is only creating more harm for our folks. But it's just so ironic that I'm reading this with her in mind now. 
Because I wrote this book with the younger version of me in mind. I wrote this whole book to Marlo, the younger version of me. And in so many ways now, I'm in real time, Panache, figuring out how to translate this stuff. Of course, there's a tension that we want to hold. These problems are very much structural. They're historical. But, you know, you chose a genre, which is a memoir, which is your story. If you think about the best of any Black tradition, we can have the collective, but there's always space for the individual. So I want to hear you. And also speaking to why you chose a specific genre, why the epistolary form, the letter form became the form that you decided you're going to reach out to us in this moment. Um, of course, we're living in an era where we have the personal essay, you know, the personal confessional essay, which is very, you know, if we think of the extreme end of that as a very sort of navel gazing kind of genre, but of course, you come from a different historical tradition where the personal has always been political. It has always been mm-hmm. testimony to the collective. So writing the slave narratives, for example, it was told by himself, told by herself as testimony to the lives of Black people. This is an individual story. And I'm not speaking for all Black people, but I am testifying to the world and the lives that we live. I just reread Frederick Douglass now. We're doing this in class and looking at that as an abolitionist manifesto at that time. Now thinking about this as an abolitionist memoir, what does this genre mean for you and how you can speak in ways that other kinds of just writing a report on these are the stats on Black mass incarceration or these are the stats on gun violence? What does this particular form do for you that other forms can't? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think particularly even just thinking about abolition as a praxis, I think this book at the very least speaks how difficult it is. I think that just believe that people who believe in this as an idea, as a practice, think it's, oh, we can just do it. We just got to do it. And a lot of the work has to be done on the internal for us to be able to sort of shift and change the way we think. In fact, I always say like this book, Bird of Cage and Abolitionist Freedom Song, the word abolition, you don't see that word in this book until the last, I don't know, five pages or so. And it's because I didn't start this book saying I'm going to write an abolitionist book. I didn't arrive at abolition through this book. But what I'm saying is that the experience I've had Through the writing of it, I was like, oh, wow, this confirms in so many ways why I believe in this as a praxis. And in terms of genre, the memoir, the letters throughout the book, just on a personal note, when I was inside, journaling and letters was my form of refuge. I write about in this book, but there's a youth program that I was a part of while I was inside, where I wrote to young people who were on the outside or in school. And that letter writing, I learned so much about me through writing to 11, 12, 13 year old children. I mean, them writing to me. I like to write things and create work that really pierces the soul. I can do the stats and those type of things, the journalist type essay or articles. I can do those too, and I do them too. But I also know that the things that people remember, the things that they feel. And even in that passage that I just read, I felt it, you know, and me just reading him again. And so many for me personally, we live in some things when I read it, but also I understand that people learn better. We hold on to things better when we feel them. Maya Angelou, who <laughs> my daughter is named after, I'm paraphrasing, but people may not remember what you say or do, but they remember how you made them feel. For me, this is such a deep and serious issue. A lot of the violence work that I've done in my own community here, right? The same community I grew up in, the same community I created harm in, it was where I did a lot of work in creative programming, et cetera. And over the last couple of years, I would travel on my own. I'm a good networker. I connect with people like Hanover Park. I was there to give a talk at a college, at a university in Joburg, but I knew somebody and I ended up going to this community. Point I'm getting to is that I make an effort to visit certain places where probably people from that same country wouldn't go to. And I just kept seeing the same stories. I was seeing the same stories, the same people in so many different ways. People I grew up with, people I did time with, people I've worked with or serviced over the years. And like, there's a connective tissue. One, I think those of us who are in these communities, I want us to be connected more. But also the issues that we speak about, that we're speaking about now, is not endemic to one person or one place. And I think that's the thing that hurts us the most when we think it's just only us happening, us here in this community, that community. And because it also takes away from where the real oppression is coming from when we just think about just us. It takes our eyes off the prize. I'm gonna give you one example. I was in a prison in Trinidad. Trinidad and Caribbean is where my family is from. I was a youth jail and a young man who was in this room is a room about maybe 20 or so boys, similar to the same group of boys I met with in Durban. Anyway, there's one boy, small in stature and probably one of the youngest. He's 17, but small in stature, but he's also the one who's most vibrant. You can tell he's like the leader. He's, you know, the alpha in the room. And he's wearing, I don't know if you've seen him, but he's wearing like a, not a necklace, but like a picture of a person on his shirt. And usually when you see people wearing that, it's a picture of somebody who may have died. 
we're in a conversation in the room. I asked him who's that person, and he tells me it's his brother. And so I'm like, what happened? And he tells me something that his brother was killed just a couple months before that, his younger brother, by a police officer in Trinidad. And he also told me that he has an older brother that's in this same jail with him. He didn't tell me the specifics of what he was arrested for. He said the reason why he was in jail is because the older brother is probably not as tough as he is and whatever, and probably needs protection. His mother wanted him in so many ways to protect her last, she didn't want to lose another son. So at least he would be there. He'd be able to protect her older son. And when you hear this, initially, like, that makes no sense. That's illogical. Why would you do that? But people are making desperate decisions, and they're not the most logical. But I'm not here for the standpoint of the POV to determine what's logical or not. I'm here to speak to the fact that people are making desperate decisions. That's a desperate decision to make. Whether it was him that was pushing for the boy or whether it was the mother, whoever it was, that was a desperate decision to make. A harmful decision It's not helping anything. And so many of our young folks I've seen are making desperate decisions, are making adult decisions when they don't have to, when they shouldn't be in a place to having to make adult decisions. Sometimes they have to. Sometimes they have to, you know. For me, I needed to figure out in the process of writing, the core where my desperation came from. I was hoping that whoever reads it can at least be open to the possibility that they are also acting on some level of desperation and harm that is bigger than them and not just the person who lives across the street from them. The way you described it and described that it's hard. I think what you say, the idea that people remember what they feel and how powerfully you do this the way you have with words and especially the epistolary form that you use, the letter form, we can think about many of the great books within the genre, right? So I'm thinking about Malcolm X and how transformative that's been in my life and the whole range of people's lives. So in thinking about a consciousness about the situation of us as Black people, but specifically even the genre of writing from prison, what that has meant for us as Black people, whether it's in the continent, so you think of people like Mugi Tiongo, Ole Shoyinka, of course, South Africa has a huge genre of prison writing, but now you're writing, looking back on that particular experience. One of the things that really struck me was some of the literature that you mentioned that was part of the experience of being in prison. So specifically looking at Bell Hooks, Asada Shakur, of course, also Angela Davis. Talk to me about that kind of literature. And again, because you're very specific about a kind of writing that's going to reach the kind of people who are not reading about the reports and frankly, because they maybe don't need to, because they know what's happening. They know what's happening in their neighborhoods. They don't need to have those kinds of reports to confirm what they really know. Just speak to me about the kinds of literature that are speaking to people where they're at. Yeah, you mentioned Malcolm X. Anywhere in the world, obviously, this book has a universal impact. But if you're in prison, you read Malcolm X's book and you see yourself in him. And you mentioned some of the other folks I read. I was introduced to these folks inside, for the most part. I might have heard their names pass along somewhere, but I had no idea who they were. I was introduced to these people through literature inside. You get to hear about the Black experience, but also, you know, particularly think about Bell and folks, they write about the white gaze on the Black experience in different ways. And I think for me, at the time where I was at, I was literally stepping out of a bubble because for the first couple of years of my time in prison, I went back to a religion that I was raised on, right? A Jehovah's Witness. They kind of discouraged from reading secular books. So for the first couple of years of my time, I didn't read any quote unquote secular books. It's not until a little bit later that I started reading and that started changing my mindset a lot and become more active in the facilities that I was in. Those type of texts, I want to go right back to the Malcolm X texts. He is immediately accessible. Even though it's a biography, it is immediately accessible, not only in the words, but the experiences. Because before I read his book, I didn't know that much about him other than him being the good brother Malcolm X. And the thing that stood out to me about him and even in his book is about his evolution as a person. That's what I admire most about the brother is that he's always evolving in terms of how he saw the world, how he saw himself. I think all of us should be in a position and ready to be able to evolve in the way we see things and see the world and the way we see ourselves with principle. Some of those texts that I had referred to inside of this book, I would put them on the same level as the music I listen to inside. In this book, I speak a lot about music as well. It's called a freedom song. I look at music in the same way I look at a lot of these texts. As you alluded to earlier, Nasha, a lot of music is testimony. It's accessible. It's reggae for me. There's hip hop for me and obviously soca music where my family's from. A lot of reggae texts are the same thing as this book. It's no different. It's just that this is 200 some odd pages and they got it in 16 bars or however you do it, two, three minutes. They are telling us about what they observe and they also give us diagnosis at times. And I think that's how I learned to be a better writer. 
It's about reading those type of texts and listening to the music that I listen to. I can't write unless I'm listening to music because I need to have a rhythm. Maybe it's the black in me. I don't know. But like, I need to have a rhythm anytime I'm writing because I think that's the way words flow better. Music is an elixir. Music can change our moods in any direction. Obviously, words can as well. The words within the music can do it as well as the melody. You ask me questions, I go so many different directions. But I absolutely love it. And sometimes we can spend all kinds of tracks talking about abolition, whatever. But NWA said it, fuck the police. Done. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the succinct way of describing the project of abolition, fuck the police. And just please tell us where the title of the book comes from and the specific oh. poem that you'd written. I don't know if you want to share some of that, but I think that's a really important moment. Oh, yeah. Bird and Cage is based on Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sing. It was a book that I had read when I was in a form of solitary when I was inside. And it was a really, really tough part of my time inside. And that book somehow came into my hand. I can't tell you how it fell into my cell, but it came into my cell somehow. I just kind of connected to it and eventually wrote a poem that's in this book. That poem, I originally wrote it while I was in solitary, but I ended up using it for the kids I was writing to. So that's where the title comes from. And then the second half of Abolition is Freedom Song. It's really from Bob Marley, Redemption Song. Freedom Song, Redemption Song. That's a song I could have played for you on Steel Pan. If I have my pan with me, I can play that. It's interesting. And that song has been a song I've loved since I was a young teenager. The testimony in that song, once again, aligns with the testimony that I put in this book. One of the things I really love from Toni Morrison is when she speaks about a knowing so deep, thinking about your work, you can feel there's that sense of the knowing so deep, that which cannot be even captured in words, that which cannot be captured in the reports and the statistics. I think that's something that you really capture within Bird Uncaged. So thank you very much for sharing your story with us. I loved so much the way in which you brought in music and how it was a space of sanctuary. So thinking about this idea of a knowing so deep and a feeling so deep, what music meant for you and has meant for you across your life? And in particular, connecting with the particular tradition of steel pans, what does that mean or what does that do for you? Even in your TED Talk, it's the second thing that you mentioned is the steel pad, and then you end off again on music. And especially because sometimes we think that the written word as the book is the only form of the most important form of knowledge. What about that specific tradition? Was it a form of freedom or a praxis of freedom for you? Yeah, yeah. The steel pan, I still play now. It's tradition family-wise. My father played when he was in Trinidad as a young man in the 60s. All the siblings did. So there's a family tradition to it. But also, you mentioned a TED Talk. And the steel pan is another testimony to like what can come from the place that people hate or people think are terrible. It's an instrument created in the ghetto, in the hood. People associate thuggery and all these sort of things with the instrument. That's who created the instrument. This instrument is now played all over the world. So for me, like knowing that history of the instrument, but also music and words, they've always been like sanctuaries for me. I've played the steel pen since I was about 15, I think, 15 years old. The longest period of time I went without playing, it was when I was away in prison. It's a healing, quite frankly. Bringing current events again, my daughter, Maya, her mother had a birthing playlist. And I had added some songs onto it too. When she was crowning, when Maya was crowning, the song that was playing was Positive Vibrations by Bob Marley. It just happened that way. But I felt for me, that was like connective tissue, serendipity, whatever it is. Thing about both of us, the Black folks particularly, I think rhythm is one of our superpowers. And music is. I mean, it's one of the things that they try to stop us from playing and using and engaging in drums. They try to stop us, literally, particularly in the Caribbean. It became illegal to play instruments because it's power and it's a communication. That's how enslaved Africans got messages across. We all know that. You know, Harriet Tubman stories, all these sort of things. Music got me through prison. Is a thing that still gives me energy and gives me life. It's how I create words. Like I said, I can't write unless I listen. And the steel pan, as a kid growing up, where I would play steel pan here in New York is during the summer months when you would play because you're practicing for a big competition around Labor Day, which is in September. I'll have to go to another part of Brooklyn to play. And I would go there, we call it the pan yard. You play in a yard. And it was the safest place for me. You pan, you practice from like eight and you could go late into the morning, like two in the morning. I would come back to the block where I'm from after I played pan. They'd be like, yo, this happened. And this happened. We're about to do this. And this fight happened. And I'd be like, oh, wow, I missed all that. Not in a way like, oh, man, I missed that. But like, yeah, I missed that. Good. I'm happy I was away. The only time I ever got in trouble is when I was away from the pan. You know what I mean? Playing music. It's always been a safe space for me. I think that's also my father. My father played steel pan. I always brag about it. There's a national competition that they have in Trinidad. My father played on the band. I won the first two. So within these things, within our words, within our music, within our rhythms, 
there's not only healing there, but there's possibilities in there. And we think about freedom dreams, we think about abolitionist possibilities. Our music is one of the ways we can communicate those things. That's how South Africa think about apartheid and the music. It's a real thing. It's not just the thing that we dance to. Yeah, it's all of it. It's the pain, it's the pleasure, it's the joy. So thank you so much for holding the space for us and just taking the time to pen and meditate and to go through all the things. It takes an incredible amount of vulnerability, which is in itself the greatest form of strength. Thank you for modeling a different way of moving through the world, a different mode of being as part of bringing into being this abolitionist dream. So thank you so much, Marlon. It's really been an honor to be in conversation with you. Thank you so much to the Atlantic Fellowship as well for asking me to be in conversation with you. It was really such a wonderful thing to be in your world, to be with you. Thank you.